the um, yeah, I'm working with a uh, biomathematics group in uh, Germany that's doing uh, systems medicine and systems uh, biology. And um, I don't have a biology background, I have a mathematics background and uh, philosophy, so I'm helping them on uh, what they call multi-level uh, models and sort of the higher level of the model. It doesn't talk about the biochemical uh, substrata. And uh, we've begun to uh, get a sort of general picture of classify the different types of model that seems to be useful in modeling biological systems. Now, I don't know if this is going to help you at all in the medical language problems. Yeah. So, so this is sort of treat this as, as a few uh, mathematically motivated big ideas, which may or may not be of help in the particular uh, project that Tom's talking about here. But the uh, one of the old questions that comes up, and in, in certainly in medical language, is this idea of can you go from particular to uh, universal, the old problem of induction, and, and uh, can you go from sense data uh, to concepts, and uh, the sort of message of the philosophical tradition from David Hume is forget it, that, that um, uh, doesn't work. And We're you, on slide two. Are they really looking at the slides? Yeah, they're looking at slides separately. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to slide two. And, and um, a number of the uh, important biological systems seem to be working on the opposite model going from the universal to the particular. And uh, so turning induction on its head, whether you call it abduction or whatever else it's called. So what I want to talk about is sort of classification of the essentially four different ways in which one goes from universal to particular as uh, determined by two different forms of basic logic and, and, uh, and then particular applications of it. So if we, um, say, move on to slide three here, where do the four models come from? Then uh, there are two, it turns out there are two basic uh, forms of sort of basic elementary logic. And the one everyone's familiar with is Boolean logic. And uh, rather than thinking of it as a logic of propositions, you really should think of it as a logic of subsets, which is the way that Boole actually originally did it, so that uh, the uh, values of the variables are actually subsets of some universe rather than just zero, one, true, false. And uh, when you do that, then you're sort of expressing then ordinary logic at the right level of generality that you can see there's a dual form, a mathematically dual form, because in category theory, the dual to a subobject is a quotient object. And, and uh, uh, we know this from, if you remember your algebra course, you always had subgroups and quotient groups or subrings and quotient rings and so forth. So this, it's an old duality that was really formulated uh, best in category theory in about the 1940s. And uh, so what I did a few years ago was sort of put together the formulation of Boolean logic at the right level generality, not about propositions, because propositions don't have a dual. But subsets do. Subsets have a dual in, in terms of a partition or an equivalence relation or a quotient set. Those are all sort of equivalent notions. So the, the dual form of, of logic is this uh, illustrated here by a partition logic. And, and uh, so you have a logic of subsets and you, and you have a logic of quotient sets. And uh, this has all been developed in the uh, full sense of logic, but it's going to sort of guide the four models that I'm uh, going to talk about. And uh, the easy way to see the four models is basically you have uh, the top of each lattice and the bottom of each lattice, and then the which are types of universals, and then you move from the top or the bottom to something in the middle, and, and so those are the four ways to go from a, a universal top or bottom uh, to something in the middle, and and uh, so and I'll, I'll go over those one by one, and and uh, one of them is the selection model that 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 uh, Tom mentioned. But the ones that, that are related to partition logic are also uh, particularly interesting. And that slide four gives those uh, four different schemes, the uh, top or bottom of the two lattices, and then going to something particular uh, in the middle. So let's start with scheme one, which is starting with the top of the um, partition lattice. And the top of the partition lattice is the uh, what's called the discrete partition. It's, it's where everything is differentiated. If you think of it as equivalence relation, everything is, is uh, differentiated, so each equivalence class is a singleton. Everything is by itself, and there's no uh, 
uh, nothing is identified or smooshed together, nothing is blurred, everything is, is distinct. And how do you move from that uh, to something intermediate in the lattice? And the way you do it is by identifying things. So, so you're basically taking a quotient set and, and making a, a, a certain set of identifications. And one of the uh, simple mathematical models uh, for doing that we can think of as what, what's called a semigroup. But basically the idea is just to take some alphabet like AB and then form all finite strings, AA, uh, AB, a, B, everything, all the strings that you can form from that where the operation is just putting two strings together to make another string. And, and uh, uh, so that's uh, what would be called the, the universal uh, semigroup on, on that alphabet. And uh, it has a universal property in the sense of category theory uh, as well. And any uh, way in which you start mapping those strings together in a way that preserves concatenation so that the, the uh, uh, this, this property here will get you to a quotient group. And, and, and uh, so that gives you this universal property of, of semigroups. And uh, so here the basic idea is we start with everything separate and then we start identifying things. And, and what can we get? And it turns out, and this is going to slide six, that the most interesting case of this is recursion. So, so when you talk about mental capabilities, and humans have the mental capability to do recursion, to generate the natural numbers, then, then, then um, uh, it's, a, it's the special case where you just have an alphabet of one element, you can call it one element A, you can call it one element one, and, and then recursion in the, in the uh, universal model just generates one, 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 and so forth. But any time um, you have another set with some function on the set, where there's some type of possibility of recursion, because the map keeps eating itself, going back and, and start anywhere on the set, then it goes to something, and then you can apply it again and again and again. You keep iterating, so it might go in a circle, it might keep going linearly, whatever. But the universal, which is the natural numbers, this is the central property of natural numbers, is that you can then enumerate that you can uh, create a function which gives you this specific uh, scheme on the, on the uh, given set S. And so it's a type of quotient operation again because it might, eat, it might curl back on its own tail and, and, and uh, uh, you know, identify a number of elements. So uh, this is, if, a, lot of, a lot of what I'm saying is, is obviously motivated by Chomsky's linguistics and uh, recursion is one of the key aspects in Chomsky's linguistics that that characterizes human languages and makes them separate from animal communication systems and so forth uh, where you don't have this recursive property. So the idea there is that there's some sort of a recursion mechanism uh, built into the, uh, the mind when you develop the language capability. And when you understand something, it basically boils down in this ultra simple model to, to finding that map, to, to uh, understanding the sequence of things that came in as a, as a recursion. And uh, so you get essentially a uh, sort of bare bones mathematical model of what it means to internally understand something that, that uh, using this human capability of recursion. So this could be some sort of a uh, you know, sentence structure that may have recursion built into it. And, and so rather than just being a random sequence of sounds, when you when you get this mapping, then it's 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 understood in terms of your internal structure here, represented by the natural numbers, and and uh, as as an example of this type of recursive structure. So uh, all that is very precise. But then the next slide, slide seven, we we go to a a little more uh, free thinking application of the, of the same sort of structure, where the the uh, if you look at the top the northeast part of the slide there, uh, we have the uh, sort of the same essentially like mathematical form but now as, as a more general uh, type of a model. And so the, the uh, green stuff is the, is the uh, human being say or this could be an organism. And the uh, environment then sends audi auditory messages to the organism or to the human, let's say in this case. And the question is, what's the difference between hearing sounds in a language that you have no clue about or just random sounds in a language that you understand? And when you understand the language, it means that you have constructed this internal mapping which, which parses the, the sounds and turns them into a, a structure that assigns meaning to the auditory signals. And so this is a, 
sort of an abstract, uh, uh, well, starting with recursion and now this, sort of an abstract model of what goes on when we understand something, when we see something as something else. If you want to talk about, talk about the intentionality of perception, say. So you don't just get uh, this booming, uh, buzzing confusion of sense data. You see something as a, as a bottle or as a book. And, and because you have made this internal mapping that gives it a secondary structure that gives it an intention, an intentionality. So, Can I ask you a question, David? Sure. So on the diagram on this slide on the upper right, this is on the understanding as opposed yeah. to production. Exactly. If we look at the object in the top category. In the environment. Yeah. Right, the environment. And the, the map or arrow down to the larger green blob, that's right. something like sensation or rudimentary perception compared to conceptualization well, yeah, I'm sort of uh, mimicking a little bit of category theory here, and and and, uh, but the you have this sort of universal channel where everything comes in to the brain, and that's the the brain is the big green blob, okay. as it were, and then you have uh, some specific auditory inputs there, and the question is, can you get an internal mapping, an internal representation, which will have the same, which will map to that given auditory input? Represented by the diagonal line, yes. and and if you can't, then it's like hearing just sounds that you don't understand, Swahili or something, or Chinese. But if you do uh, understand it, then it means you've got this internal map, and now you can you can, as it were, recognize those inputs as saying something, or seeing a bunch of blobs as a book, and and so forth. So that this is this is the uh, so it's a high level high level uh, way to look at all this, but it's putting it in a mathematical framework. This is like a recursion, and recursion is an example, specific example of like a free semigroup, and a free semigroup is an example of this starting at the top of the uh, lattice of partitions and then making a quotient down to something, to some particular, by identifying things. And, and uh, that mapping is what we call understanding when the mind is able to map, uh, to understand something, to represent it internally and as, as a and then you just flip everything around and you'll get the opposite, which is where you have some internal representation of, of a uh, speech and then you go through the output channel, the universal output channel, and you turn it into a, a sequence of, of, of uh, speech. You produce speech by sort of running everything uh, in reverse. And uh, if you put those two together, then you sort of have a model of a brain as, as a understanding what is spoken in the environment and then producing intelligent speech to the environment. And, and uh, so you're, you're, you're also producing auditory outputs, but they're auditory outputs that correspond to some internal representation, what's called a speech act or an intentional uh, act uh, inside. So it's not just a production of random noise. It's, it's a external representation. Is there, is there a probability issue here? So if you have just a, a very limited amount of input, then you don't have enough recursion to, to really identify it, so you make a guess, and you could be wrong, or well, maybe but, an issue here. Yeah, that gets into Chomsky's idea of, of the language learning mechanism, which is the next model, so we'll get to that. But, but, so this already assumes a, a brain that's got real capabilities. You know, and then the question is, how do you get there? And, and, uh, which is sort of the next model. So uh, all this is... That's an interesting thing. So yeah. I, I think you alluded to the speech generation as being the reverse of the speech parsing, but in fact there's an enormous amount of hysteresis between those two pathways. Okay. And the yeah. other thing I would ask is whether you read Ray Kurzweil's recent stuff on the 300 million algorithms that constitute the hierarchy of brain reasoning. No. Okay. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good read. Okay. I mean... It's a, new, it's a new model. I mean, he developed it by watching his two-year-old grandchild <laughs> acquire language. Yeah. I mean, most most of what I'm doing is... is uh, trying to give a framework that's roughly Chomsky in, in, in uh, I haven't run him by him or something, but, but um, and, and you know, all these things are, it's, you know, you have multi-level models, and, and so at best here we're talking about the top-level model. Uh, we have no idea what the neurostructure is under the neurophysiological structure or the biochemical structure. That's all other levels in the model. So we're trying to characterize what is, how do you characterize the top-level functionality of a, of a person that understands speech and can produce speech. That's the idea. And so this is at that level. Now there may be a you know, mil million algorithms underneath this as well the, at the neurophysiological level. But, so this is sort of like the top level model. 
Okay, um, let's go to slide eight. And uh, that's a, uh, so if we remember back to the bottom of the uh, partition lattice, the bottom of the partition lattice is where everything's already identified. And so you're starting out what, what we call the blob and, or the indiscrete partition in mathematical terms. And, and uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not nothing, it's everything, but it's everything in a totally undifferentiated state. And then the question is, how do you unfold, how do you make distinctions to get something that's up in the middle of the, of the lattice, which, where you have distinctions? So you start out, you know, the first example I gave was where you had all the distinctions and you kill some of them, you identify things. You, now we're doing the opposite. We're starting at the bottom where everything is, all distinctions have been erased, and then you bring in distinctions, you make distinctions, and you get to something in, the, in sort of the middle of the lattice. And, and uh, this turns out to be an extremely useful model. And, and uh, so let me try to give you a whole bunch of sort of versions of this. And, and uh, uh, one version uh, is, is to think of uh, the second, uh, second point there, is to think of X, Y, Z uh, as sort of a generic three-digit binary number. So it's, uh, it's like a variable in the old sense of a variable. And, and, and uh, it's like, so, so we have, uh, the framework is a three-digit number, but we have no idea what it is. So they're all like squunched together here. And we want to start to sort of differentiate. What is that first digit? What's that second digit? And what's the third digit? So you start to, to differentiate. And you can think of this as, if you wish, as a game of 20 questions or three questions in this case. And, and um, so, but the, the key thing here is not to think of this as a set of eight or a set of completed options. That'll come later. That's another model. This is something where the, all the options are squished together and we start to unfold them one at a time and we unfold it one way or another way. And that's, so it's, it's, a, it's like an indefinite number that becomes more definite as we get information and information always takes the form of distinctions. It's and, a possibility space. Well, it's an actual thing, but but the, the, uh, the configurations of how it can be distinguished. Yeah, but but that's also true in the case where they're all realized, and and we'll get to that model. That's the selection model where they're all realized, and you select certain ones. Here, they're not all realized, but they're they're all squunched together. But it has a structure where they can unfold in any of those eight possibilities by plugging in the the three things. So, uh, and, it, and this is a very subtle distinction, and it really. I can get into later on uh, how people misunderstand things because they, they, they misconstrue this distinction. So, so don't think of this as a set of eight numbers. This is one indefinite number. X, Y, Z is an indefinite number. It's a variable in the old 18th century sense of a variable. It's not a set of eight numbers. Is this, this sort of like mixtures versus pure states? Uh, absolutely. It's a pure yeah. state. It's a pure state. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. <laughs> He's getting ahead of me here. We've got to slow him down. <laughs> slow down. I have less caffeine there. So basically, I'm, I'm interpreting this as the first, the left thing is the pigeonhole paradigm. You start with the form and you fill the structure. The one on the right is the, everything is miscellaneous, where you start with the substance and you make the distinctions for the form. And then it may, Sure, well, the, the, the one on the right, the partition lattice, is where you have all the distinctions at the top and none at the bottom. Right. And then you start at the top and you, you kill off distinctions. You make identifications. And that's what recursion ends up being, is, is where so you... That's the Dewey Decimal System, if you will. No, I know it's not, 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 not identify things too quickly. Okay. Uh, that's, okay. I'll... Yeah, it's... Sorry. I mean, let's, let's try to understand these things first and then we'll see what... By the way, it's about the 12th time I've looked at this and I don't fully understand it, so I won't. I'm well, learning well, I just worked, That's after we serve the beer. I see. Yeah, I just worked it out last week, so <laughs> we haven't talked since then. So. <laughs> huh? Yeah, he carries two, three of them. I don't know. I can't tell. Oh, looks fine. Battery's fine. Okay, so let's go to application. So this is slide 10? No, 9. Slide 9. Uh, stem cell. So stem cell is, is uh, uh, something that's like a, all the possible types of cell where they haven't been differentiated yet. So you, so you have this sort of universal, uh, you think of it like a set of possibilities, but it's not a set of all different possibilities already realized. It's a set of possibilities unrealized that can potentially grow into a nerve cell or a muscle cell or a stomach cell or a brain cell if they have the appropriate environment. And the environment like sends the message uh, to the stem cell to develop in one way uh, rather than another way. 
And uh, so if you put that in this framework, then you can think of the, uh, this is something I'm, my, my friends in, in um, the biomathematicians I'm working with in Europe, that, they're, they're at Rostock, did I mention uh, Rostock? It's, it's the, uh, one of the big biomath groups in, in Germany now. And uh, so one of their problems is, is, to, is to model the action of stem cells, for example, in a stomach uh, context. And then, so the idea is, is you, you're the, the, uh, the big circle here that's just white, it's white so it's not, it's not definite yet what it's going to become. But if it's in a stomach environment, then it, the message that goes to it is, is uh, you know, make, turn yourself into a stomach cell, as it were. And so one way to think of that, we'll get to a model later on of the Monad-Jacobs uh, network of genes, which you can think of as a set of switches that, that, depending on how you set those switches, then it will unfold one way or the other way, is, is, a, is a nice model. So it's not unfolded in all the possible ways that are already existing, it hasn't unfolded at all yet, but you set the switches and then it, will, then it will go one way or the other. So the environment here is setting the switches. The environment is saying, you're in a stomach environment, that's what you should turn into. And then you'll get this feedback effect because you produce stomach cells, and stomach cells then become part of the tissue environment, and then they, they keep on doing this. So this is the way that as your stomach cells die off, that your, your stomach is reproduced. Now, there are mutations that go on in this uh, process that, that uh, the, the, all the DNA coding that's way underneath the hood on this mechanism uh, may go wrong. Now, if it goes wrong, uh, ordinarily when it goes wrong, so what? Uh, there's no feedback effect. It's just some crazy thing and, and the cell is useless and it, it eventually dies and, and nothing happens. But suppose that there are ways in which it can mutate that it actually feeds back and tells the, the, the stem cells nearby to make another muta mutant. You see, so then you get a positive feedback action where you keep making the wrong cells. And that's called cancer. That's the sort of theory of, of high level theory of cancer uh, in, this, in this context. So uh, most of the mutants are, are, are harmless, but, but there are certain types of mutants that will actually, when they go in the environment, they send the wrong message back and, and, and uh, the stem cell then develops in the wrong way and you get this positive feedback with very negative results of, of uh, the uh, cancerous growth. So that's uh, application one, is the uh, stem cell application with the uh, possibility of getting out of that model a model of cancer in some sense. And what's nice about this model is, see, it has nothing to do with, with stomach. The same model would work for nerve cells, for brain cancer, for you know, uh, muscle, all that. They all are in the same situation that, uh, where you get a mutant and then the mutant, certain mutants may have the feedback effect and just grow more and more mutants. So that's called a tumor. And, and so it's a theory of cancer that applies across all tissue environments because all tissue environments have stem cells and have some mechanism by which the message goes to stem cells to produce the right thing. When that message goes wrong in a certain way, you know, just keep producing the wrong thing. And that's when you got a problem. So, uh, so it's, it's a very interesting model in the sense that it, it, it has the payoff of, of not applying just to stomach cancer, but also all the other types of cancer in different tissue environments. And it's universal because stem cells are universal. It can happen everywhere. So the next slide, uh, very different thing. And this is uh, Chomsky's language acquisition uh, device uh, that he says uh, embodies universal grammar. And so we want to get from this at least a better idea to what universal grammar is. But the idea here, this is where we get the idea of the poverty of input uh, that was just, just mentioned. And uh, so the child's linguistic capability is like this thing that, that is uh, as yet undifferentiated. It hasn't unfolded yet, as it were. And you get this blooming, buzzing, uh, confusion of auditory signals that come in. This is uh, adapting uh, William James's phrase here. And, and uh, to us, that, or this may seem like a lot of uh, uh, nonsense uh, sounds, but in fact, to the infant, this, is, uh, this triggers the unfolding. This is like the environment that makes your language, your, your grammar uh, faculty unfold in one way or other another. So you, you, you become one, one sort of grammar rule is reinforced by this, this uh, environment that you're hearing, because you're hearing German or you're hearing English or you're hearing Swahili or something. And, and so the, 
the uh, language capability during these years. There are certain years in which the child uh, has this marvelous uh, capability, then it will unfold. If the child is in a, a, a wolf child environment where there's not a human language, so you, you still get all this crazy auditory signals coming in, but they're not from a human language, so none of the switches are set then. You see, so you go through this period and then you have a wolf child that's you know, seven years old and won't ever speak a human language because they, their, their, their uh, thing didn't develop. So, so this is a, a type of model of, of, um, of human language acquisition that explains uh, also the situation where the auditory signals don't set the switches and, and, and uh, the, the develop, developmental capability of unfolding in, in one way or another um, is, is missed. And so you have a wolf child that's unable to speak a human language. And um, the interesting thing here is, is when you read the literature, at least the secondary literature, most people think of the idea of universal grammar as sort of the grammatical rules that apply to all languages. And that's not what this is. This is a faculty that will unfold to be any of the particular grammars, but it's not itself a grammar in the sense of an abstract set of rules that apply to everything. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a rolled up, uh, I don't choose your metaphor here, uh, something wh where it can unfold to give you any particular grammar, but it itself is not just sort of the, the grammatical rules that apply to all languages. That's not what universal grammar is in the Chomsky sense. It's, it's the, the, this, this thing that's like at the bottom of the lattice, it's undifferentiated yet, and then this, these auditory signals come in and they start to differentiate one way or the other, and it unfolds to make the rules of German or the rules of English and, and whatever. Time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so slide 11. Uh, I mentioned before the, the Monad Jacobs idea of the hierarchy of regulatory genes. So this is the old model of, of, of uh, uh, that's probably uh, implemented in, in a lot of these other situations. But the idea is, is that by setting the switches in this uh, network of, of regulatory genes, you can do all sorts of things. And, 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 uh, and then the the uh, basic original one that was discovered was the DNA genetic code mechanism, and and uh, the code is the is are the switch settings that come in, and then and then you get the switches set right, and it unfolds to make this amino acid rather than that amino acid, and if you get the get the uh, switch settings screwed up, or there's mutations, and you may not produce any amino acid, and and, and so forth. So it's uh, again the example of of. Uh, it's very different from having, you know, uh, if you have you know, 16 different amino acids, you don't have 16 different mechanisms. You've got one mechanism and you go and you set the switches in the right way and then it makes that amino acid. So it's an example of that scheme number two where you, you have, you're at the bottom of the lattice and you have to make distinctions and the distinctions are the switch settings, set the switch this way or that way and either experience or your environment or something has to set those switches and then it develops in that way. Uh, Eric just uh, gave away my game here by, by application five is actually this uh, partition lattice turns out to be the, uh, in my uh, opinion, the sort of key to understanding uh, what the hell is going on in quantum mechanics. And, and the example here is, is the, the, uh, the, the thing that's folded up that's indefinite is the pure state, the indefinite state where you, you're a superposition of different eigenstates and we do a measurement then it forces it to unfold in one way rather than another way. So it forces it to become definite and that's what a measurement is. I have a simple diagram here. Herman Weil talked about a quantum measurement as, as a grading where somebody had to go through the grading in one way or the other and acquired the shape as it were. So, so it didn't have a specific shape before and you're just measuring what it was. That's why the, the word measurement in the quantum mechanics context is, is, is wrong. Uh, it's something that didn't have a definite value before. It was indefinite. It hadn't unfolded one way or the other yet. And you do a measurement, you force it then to go through one hole or the other and then acquires that shape as it were. This is obviously a metaphor uh, for that. And I just had my eyes checked and it occurred to me, you, know, you all you remember when they put this thing around to do your eye check and she says, is, is it, you cover up one eye, is, is it one or two better? Well, this is like setting the switches on, on, on a thing. And, and so if you had, you know, six switches that are binary, then you've got two to the six possibilities. So the other way to do it would be to have two to the six or 64 glasses out there and you try each one on. And instead, you, you do this, un set the switches and you unfold to all the 64 ways. So the, the, uh, the one where you have the 64 glasses already there, 
is we'll see later on the selection model and then you select the ones here it's it's this other model of where they unfold in, in possibly in 64 different ways and it's taken us a while to sort of really see how to classify these different models to see if they're really different and and uh, if we get time I'll go into so I use the phrase objective indefiniteness is that yeah. coming sooner no that is that's what I mean by the the blob there it's 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 these pure state to the the the, the uh, it's, it's, it's not just that it's subjectively indefinite, it has a specific value, but we don't know what it is. It's objectively indefinite. It doesn't have a specific value yet. It's got to unfold into one of those values or be molded in one of those values if you use that grading uh, but the metaphor. But indistinctness or indefiniteness is actually a property or a distinction. We know that this is indefinite. This is the bread box. We don't know what's inside of it necessarily, but the fuzziness of the concept if you work your way down is, is objectively understood. No, it's, it's, the bread box is, is, it'd be more like you've got a blob of dough and, and you're, you're making some pasta, say, and you've got to squirt it through, okay. you know, a number of different things and that will get, that'll, that'll make it, you know, into that type of pasta or this type of pasta okay. or whatever, depending on which one you squirt it through. Okay. And, and, but it, but it wasn't like it was one of those before and you just didn't know what it was and you opened up the bread box and say, oh, we've got, you know, this type but of pasta. The point is that this it's indefiniteness a, becomes a, uh, a part of your scheme. You, you understand in your partition logic yeah. whether this is definite or indefinite. Yeah. So, so, so the question is, will this be useful to to model some of the indefiniteness in, in uh, you know the problems of medical language? And, and I don't know. I mean, we, it may. I'm, so I'm just giving you this sort of uh, well, from, from a philosophical <laughs> point of view, you would you're making an ontological commitment that the indefiniteness you are committing to that, that that is something that exists. Abs abs absolutely, yeah. 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 And, and in, in the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yeah. Okay, scheme three, we go now over to the Boolean lattice there, and we go from the top of the Boolean lattice, which was just the universe set. So, so we, we start off with all the uh, elements of the set, and then we have some mechanism by which we filter them out and we select them or we kill off uh, half of them, and we're left with some subset. So we go from the universal set of them all uh, to the to the um, specific set of ones that satisfy some criteria. And, and of course, in the biological, if we go to the next slide, uh, 14 there, the biological example is, is selection. And the fitness function is, of course, that you can survive in this environment. And, and uh, the, here's a case of where the universal set of variants, it doesn't exist at one time, but over time, you get all this generation of variants. And in fact, it, it, it connects back to the DNA thing, that if you, if our biological variation was limited, say we had specific mechanisms to produce amino acids that had no coding, they were just specific mechanisms and you had, you know, 16M or whatever it was, and you had a mutation, well, you just have one, you know, screwed up uh, mechanism, but when you have a coding system, then the code gets messed up and then you get something entirely different. And, and so the, this has been made before by a number of biologists like John Maynard Smith, that it's because of the coding mechanism that we get such enormous variety of biological variants. And, and, and you know, they all have the same mechanism in there, but because you have this code, which once one thing in the code changes, it doesn't mean you just have a, a mechanism that doesn't work. It means you're now you're producing something quite different because the code has some meaning in, in a different context. So that generation of, of biological variants is what selection works on, and, and, and so you have this like universe not necessarily all existing at the same time, and, and then biological fitness functions uh, select out. So uh, that's the basic idea of selection as, as a mechanism. Application number two, which is slide 15, uh, is the immune system. And this was, uh, if, if you go back to uh, the earlier theories of the immune system, early, early uh, 20th century, the idea was that somehow the germ or the antigen uh, comes in and sends a message, instructs the antibodies to, to lock into them in a certain way, and, and then uh, that, that neutralizes the antigen. But it turned out that that actually works on not that instructionist model, but on selectionist model, that the immune system actually generates uh, the full set of antibodies that, that seem to be needed, but they're in low concentration. And this is called the selectionist uh, theory. And so when an antigen comes in, it, it, it finds this, this vast array and it, it 
then hooks up with one that where you know, the, the uh, latch fits. And then that sends a message to that one to produce a lot more of those. So you get this clonal reproduction. They clone itself a zillion times. And, and then that goes and, and, and locks into all the other ones that are, uh, all the other germs that are coming in. So people couldn't believe at first that, that uh, the immune system could actually operate on a selection theory because that meant that you had to generate these, uh, these antibodies in low concentration for all things that the body had never seen. There's, there's no, the body was never instructed to do these things. Uh, that, you know, the new types of germs come in and new types of uh, foreign substances and non-self uh, foreign substances. And, and uh, yet the, the, the system um, turns out to generate like essentially all the possible ones that you might see. And uh, so this, the, the sort of uh, philosophical biologist that really captured this idea was Niels Jerne, J-E-R-N-E. And uh, he even recognizes, the, recognized the connection back to Chomsky. His, his Nobel Prize speech was called the, the generative grammar of the immune system. So he was trying to combine the Chomsky idea and his, even though we see they're actually different schemes. And uh, this is uh, something that Chomsky's tried to impress upon people, that he's, his model is not selectionist in that sense, but, but uh, because it's not all possible grammar sitting there and some of them get selected, it's this thing where the universal grammar unfolds, whereas here in the, in the immune system it is all possible a antibodies are there, but in low concentration. And uh, Gerald Edelman down the road here uh, in, in where is he, La Jolla Scripps, yeah, uh, he got the Nobel Prize for his work on the immune system, but then he was so taken with this idea of selection that he then became a neurophysiologist. So he's applied this idea to try to model all these uh, mechanisms in the brain. And, and uh, so, for example, uh, he would account for perception by saying that, that the, the brain sort of randomly has all these connections and all these, these, these uh, 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 neural connections and then the, the sense data comes in and sort of activates certain circuits and not others and when those circuits are activated then they get more wired in as it were and the others sort of atrophy and, and so in that way uh, you know the child uh, learns things. Now that's pretty grossly uh, thinking that induction can take place and, and, and the concepts can come from that so uh, Chomsky and Edelman don't seem to get on very well because the Chomsky is very much, uh, you know, the, the universal has to exist first, and, and the, the um, so he has a very different model, shall we say, of, of, uh, of that. But uh, that's Edelman's theory, is, is, is that you, uh, and he, he applies it at different stages, but he calls it neural Darwinism, because it's this, all these neural circuits that generate all this variety, and then the experience selects out certain ones that get reinforced, and, and, uh, and uh, of course, if you, learn language that way, then of course every child would speak their own language and it, it would have no uniformity and so forth. And so Chomsky is very critical of this, but uh, it is a selection scheme and, and uh, may well have applications. And uh, uh, if you read Edelman's books on neural Darwinism or the like, uh, you'll see that that's essentially the idea. Three yeah, I'm almost finished here. Uh, so the, 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 the fourth scheme and last scheme is, is uh, this would be the next slide. So you're starting at the bottom now of, of, the, um, of the Boolean lattice, which is the empty set, and you move to something in the middle of the lattice, some particular subset, and, and uh, so uh, I'm not sure this has very many applications. <laughs> this is a, sort of fills out the logical scheme of the four ways to do it, but... Uh, cosmology. Yeah, maybe, co well, the old cosmology, not the new one. Because I, th I think cosmology is really scheme two, not scheme four. <laughs> but uh, so here we have the two uh, uh, schemes. So if we, if you think of our world as being there in the middle, you. So we have we have this macro world of, of all these definite things and so forth. And, and so what's the creation story behind it? So the usual creation story is this scheme four, that you start with a void and then things are created. And as things are created, they all, you know, satisfy Leibniz's principle of they're all. Uh, fully propertyed out, and, and if two things have the same property, then they can't be different. They have to be the same thing. So everything that comes in the world is fully propertyed out, fully definite, and you just create more and more things until you get the universe. 
But scheme two says, no, you, you don't start with the void, you start with the blob. You start with the substance that is undifferentiated, and then creation is a story of making distinctions in this. And this turns out actually to be uh, essentially what's going on in the Big Bang, but it's, it's uh, the making distinctions is, 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 is uh, what's called symmetry breaking, and the what you start with before the Big Bang is perfect symmetry. Everything is identified, and, and so all your symmetry groups completely identify everything, and then symmetry gets broken. Things start to differentiate, and you get different types of forms. No creation of energy. Energy is all there all along, but the energy is undifferentiated, and energy is substance, of course, in this. So the symmetry breaking are your dits. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Dits. Distin dis distinctions. The, the uh, dits versus bits. But here's the idea of it's from, usually they, people say it's from bits, where now it's, I would just say it's from dits. <laughs> and and uh, for making distinctions. And the distinctions are made by, by uh, in this context, by symmetry breaking. And, and, the, and, and this determines what in quantum mechanics are called the state independent properties, like the mass or the charge of an electron and the spin. Whereas Ordinary quantum measurement also is, ta is talking about distinctions, but those are distinctions that, that talk about state-dependent properties. That, that where you have a, you know, when, when you have different momentum or you have a different position, but you still have the same mass in, in, a, in, a, in a particle that characterizes different types of particles. So there are different ways in which distinctions are made, and the Big Bang story is essentially scheme two, uh, where you start off with this, uh, uh, you know. Singularity and energy, and then distinctions start being made by. You know, we're free to uh, uh, follow up on this later. He's 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 down here frequently, and uh, uh, so he, he's he's invitable for for more work. It would be here. nice to have that summary I mean, uh, visible as we talk about other things. If we had a, if, it'd be nice if we had it printed out or something so we could figure out what it maps to as we, if yeah. we come up with other distinctions. Well, I'll keep the PowerPoint open mm -hmm. so we can well, at I least I on the projector. I, I think I'd be interested in the people who have a founding in medical informatics to look at this and, and, and see if there is a, an overlap. To me, it, it looks good, and I, I see it mapping very closely to the everything's miscellaneous Google-type search where it extracts the information. You just throw all your books in the library, just make sure they're uniquely identified, and then you let Google figure it out rather than have a, a cadre of librarians doing the Dewey Decimal System on it. And, uh, I, I can't stop thinking about Werner Vinge's uh, story in uh, Rainbow's End, where he talks about the UCSD library digitizing itself by uh, shredding all the books and photographing the shreds as they fly out into the garbage truck and then reconstruct. I presume they got reconstructed okay. But, uh, <laughs> well, where, where there was ambiguity, they, they would just shred another library. I see. <laughs> <laughs> shred all the libraries. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, David. Uh,